So, uh, what do you know about the Dreamcast? If you were born in the early to mid 90s, were a Sega fan like me as a kid, or you're on the gaming side of YouTube, you more likely have heard about the Dreamcast. This was Sega's last attempt to stay relevant in the console market after the release of the Sega Saturn. However, because of the behemoth that was the PlayStation 2, the Dreamcast would be Sega's very last console. But just because it had a short lifespan of two years, oh, damn! Doesn't mean that it didn't have some great games. We have the classics such as Shin Mu, Power Stone, Skies of Arcadia, and of course, Sonic Adventure 1 and 2. But there is one game, or games from this console that is barely talked about here on YouTube. And that game we'll be reviewing today is the Funkified Adventure in Space called Space Channel 5. Released in Japan in 1999 in the year 2000 in the US, Space Channel 5 was the first and only game developed by the short-lived Sega AM9, who after a year would end up becoming United Games artist. Now the man behind this game would be Tetsuya Mizuguchi, who was responsible for developing Sega Championship Rally, Res, and even helped out with Tetris Effect as one of the game's producers. Now for how Space Channel 5 was conceived, that's actually a kind of a funny story, as Sega ordered Mizuguchi to make a game that would appeal to the casual female market, which bewildered the fuck out of him because he didn't even know there was a market for that. Then again, it's the 90s, so I mean, yeah. He would end up getting Yumiko Miyabe, who worked as the art director for Nice Into Dreams and Panzer Dragoon as this game's art director, and Takashi Yuda as the game's director. Fun fact, did you guys know that Takashi Yuda was the one who created Knuckles? Yeah. A little fun fact I found during my research. There's gonna be plenty more where that come from. Space Channel 5 would end up taking inspiration from many sources, such as the musical Stomp for the general gameplay, or Bella for the design of Ulala, and British composer Ken Woodman for the main theme of the game. And when it finally came out, the reception for this game was good. People generally enjoyed it, with the main issue being the way that the graphics would kind of sync to the overall game, if that makes sense, and its short length. Now, I won't talk about the sales just yet, as it isn't overly related here, but once we get to the second game, you'll see what I'm talking about. And while I'm on that, Space Channel 5 is another one of those short franchises as it only has three games in total, or four if you consider the GBA ports, maybe? Yep, that one's weird. And before you ask or before you be like, hmm, is Kuro going to review the VR Space Channel 5 game? No, because I don't have a PlayStation console, nor do I have a VR headset. Wait, no, I mean, I do have a PS2 and the PS3. Yeah, okay, that's besides the point. But as I mentioned before, not a lot of people really talk about this game beyond there being less plays here and there. You know what? I want to change that. I think this game deserves as much love as Parappa and some of the Amigo. I know I haven't uh, mentioned that game yet in terms of, you know, reviewing it and shit, but it's going to happen eventually. It's going to happen eventually. So let's go and check out Space Channel 5 and its sequel. Like always, let's go and check out that story. And oh shit, I forgot this game doesn't really have a story. Damn, at this point, we're really going two for two. And honestly, I think this section or this part of the video in general is going to be the shortest. Hmm. Space Channel 5 focuses on Ulala, a space reporter who's investigating an invasion being caused by these little aliens known as Moralings. As we investigate further into the issue, things aren't exactly as they seem, and we later find out that the Moralings were being brainwashed by the boss of Space Channel 5, Chief Blank, in an effort to drive up ratings. With the help of reporters such as Pudding, Jaguar, and Michael Jackson, oh wait, no, his name here is Space Michael, we manage to stop Blank and we end up walking off into space with our fellow supporters. And I have a million questions, starting with how the fuck can they walk on the Milky Way and easily breathe in space? Does this game really take place in space or is it just someone tripping off some NDMA? I don't know, but man, these visuals are fucking crazy. Okay, so sorry for going a little bit off topic there, but I mean, there really isn't much to talk about with the story. Space Channel 5 isn't exactly a story-driven game, and for that matter, it isn't really a fully character-driven game either. Pudding and Jaguar are simple rival characters who help on the occasion, and we have Space Michael who barely speaks in this game. Actually, fun fact, Michael Jackson's inclusion in this game was actually a last-minute decision. During the last bit of development for the game, Michael discovered it and ended up asking to be in it, and despite managing to include him, his inclusion in this game wouldn't be much until at least the next one. Now beyond that though, there isn't really anything to talk about regarding the story. 
but it's understandable though as the rhythm game at the time didn't really have any grand stories or anything. Hell, in the case of Space Channel 5, it's more like an interactive music video. Now, the second game would be slightly more story driven, but again, not by much. And yeah, there uh, really isn't anything else besides just to get into that gameplay. Well, okay, there's also the 60s inspired fashion that I really like, but you know, yeah, so, so. Space Channel 5's gameplay is the game Simon Personified. In it, you have to copy the computer's moves to the beat, using the D-pad as well as the A and B buttons to have ooh la say chew or hey. In order to invest in each level, you have to get a certain amount of ratings for that level, but don't worry about reaching it as the ratings carry over between levels. Though, you might have to worry about getting the game over because of one other thing. In some parts of the level, you'll have hearts, and if you make a single mistake, then you'll lose one. Run out of them all, then it's game over. Now, luckily, if you do get a game over, it does give you the option to start midway into the level, so you don't have to play for the very beginning. However, expect to get a game over often, because boy, this game is awesome shit. This game seems to suffer from one of the worst things that a rhythm game can have, input lag. <gasps> Like I mentioned in the last video, input lag can make a rhythm game damn near unplayable, and unfortunately, I had a lot of moments like that happening. Originally, I wanted to play through the Dreamcast version, but during recording, I ended up getting stuck on the second level for some reason because it felt like my inputs weren't registering at all. Once that shit happened, I jumped ship to the PS2 version, where it was slightly better until the dirt stage, and at that point, I just said, fuck this shit, and... Who the fuck is calling me while I'm recording? Uh, hold on. Sorry. Hello? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. Okay. Mm. So, correction. If you want to play Space Channel 5 or honestly any rhythm game on older consoles, it's better to play on actual hardware, and I know, I know, emulation is a much more convenient and cost-effective way of playing all of your favorite games. But it isn't exactly perfect, and of course, it's prone to issues. Apparently, the biggest issue, at least for me, was input lag, which I had experienced on Flatcast and PCSX2. Though, oddly enough, when I was recording Parappa, I didn't experience it on Duck Station. Nor did I experience it with Parappa 2, which I also used a PCS X2 emulator with, and like, uh, 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 huh? This some more bullshit. In the case of Space Channel 5, with playing on actual hardware, it feels so much better, and I didn't even realize this until I played the second game on my PS2. Fuck this shit, bro. So if you want to play Space Channel 5, and for that matter, the sequel, play on original hardware. You will take yourself later. As for the structure of Space Channel 5, and for that matter, the sequel too, the levels are split between three sections. The first section of the level has you saving hostages to build your groovy army. The second is a rival battle of sorts, and the third section is the boss of that level. Now for the most part, this structure does go unchanged, and in the case for the first game, you can beat it in under an hour. But don't let this short link fool you as similar to the first Parappa, this game can be difficult. Even without the issues of input lag, Space Channel 5 is mainly difficult if you can't remember things on the fly, which became my biggest issue in getting through both of these games. Some levels were fine, but Stage 3 became the vein of my fucking playthrough. First of all, this stage is like a very fast-paced, visually vomiting of a stage. The songs go by really fast, and it was hard for me to concentrate because some of the parts were really fun to listen to. And after about three attempts of this level, I said, fuck it and inputted a cheat code that was built into the game. Now pausing the menu and entering this code right here will have the CPU take control and play through the game for you. Now this is cool if you mainly want to experience the visuals and music, but if you want to play the levels for yourself, you can't deactivate it which sucks, but it's all the more worth it if you want to experience the music in this game and just dance, which I'll go more into for the you know next part. And that's Space Channel 5. Yeah, I told y'all it was going to be short. My time with Space Channel 5 was really fun though. The gameplay is cool, if not mildly annoying to myself at least, but I can't deny that I spent the majority of the game just dancing, which made me glad that I turned on the CPU mode, because I would have been stuck on the fourth stage just dancing my ass off. Now, we're not entirely done with this game yet, as it ended up getting a very strange port on the Game Boy Advance. Now, in 2003, Sega released Space Channel 5 Ulala's Cosmic Attack. 
This game is a straight up port of the first game and has some interesting sprite work associated with it. It came out during the time when Sega was just drawing all of their games on different platforms, which was also the same case for Jet Set Radio, a subject for another time. But despite it being a cool novelty, there's not a lot of reasons to go through it and you're better off playing the Dreamcast or the PS2 version if you just want to play the first game. And you know what? Speaking of the PS2, this is the perfect moment to go and check out the last game. At the time of Space Channel 5's release, Sega went all out for his promotion. They had Ulala as a presenter for the Best Dance Award at the MTV Awards, and at one point she could have had her own little show there, but for reasons unknown, it would never surface. She also showed up in the Josie and the Pussycats movie with the less, uh, subtle advertisement. However, despite all of this promotion and marketing across the world, the game surprisingly didn't sell well. In Japan, it only sold over 93,600 units. In the US, it sold over 86,340 units. But despite this, Sega still greenlit a sequel, and in 2002, Space Channel 5 Part 2 was released. Only in Japan, though. Western audiences will have to wait a year for it to come out, but the game wouldn't come to the Dreamcast. Nope, instead, this game would be released on the PS2 alongside the first Space Channel 5 in 2003. This game was simultaneously developed for the Dreamcast and PS2, and the first big difference is that things are fully 3D now. In the last game, they went with a pre-rendered background as a stylistic choice, but due to how difficult it was and wanting a more quote-unquote cinematic feel, they ended up going with the full 3D, which does look a whole lot better. Most of the people from the first game returned with Yumiko Miyabe becoming a director for the game. Unfortunately, Takashi Yuda will only come back again for reasons unknown. The PS2 version was the main version I used to experience these games, but if you don't have a PS2, there's two other ports that you can play. There's the Steam port and the Xbox 360 port that was a part of the Dreamcast collection. The latter is how I experienced the game, and if you still have a 360, I definitely recommend hunting a copy of this down. And now it's time to check out the last mainline game, but before we do that, I kind of want to do something a little different. To make a long story told short, Space Channel 5 Part 2 is just the first game with a ton of improvements, and those improvements are mainly seen within the gameplay, which, you know what, let's talk about first. Trust me, this will be quick. Space Channel 5 Part 2's gameplay is full of improvements that makes this game the one I would recommend the most. First of all, you don't need a certain rating anymore in order to pass the stage, you just need to make sure that your hearts don't go down to zero. And during boss fights, your ratings get converted into stars. The higher the ratings you have, the more stars you can get. And while it isn't dire during the first half of the game, starting with the fourth level, you have to make sure to keep it up, cause that's when the game can get harder. There is a small addition to the game with instruments, and it's simplified to the point where most times you're just pressing down on the D-pad. Finally, there are moments when the opponent will break out into a song, and you have commands to hit after it's done. Beyond that, the game doesn't really introduce anything insanely new. And to be honest, the game is actually a lot easier than the first game, though the fourth and especially the fifth stage can fuck you up if you're not careful. See? Pretty short. Now I am going to save my experience for later, as I don't have much to say besides the fact that I was dancing the whole time, but for the story though, there's a little bit more to it now. Space Channel 5 Part 2 is somewhat similar to the first game, though instead of dealing with the Moralines and Chief Blink, we're now following Ulala dealing with a new group known as the Rhythm Rouges. And don't let these dancing niggas fool you either, they're more of a threat than the Moralines. They kidnap the space president, which makes me wonder about the politics of space, and they steal the Space Channel 5 satellite dish alongside killing Ulala's boss, Fuse. And while all of this is going on, we get hints that one of the subordinates for the Rouges might be an old ally. It's Jaguar. And the game doesn't even hide it either. We literally see him getting kidnapped in the beginning, and you can easily connect the dots that he was being controlled by the Rhythm Rouges. Regardless, Ulala manages to save him with the help of Pudding, Space Michael, the Moreland boss of the first game, and the new character Pine from the Sexy Space Police. They go off to face Purge, the leader of the Rhythm Rouges, and while at first it seems impossible, she ends up getting assistance from her friends, supporters, and Fuse, hey, he ain't dead. Ulala manages to defeat Purge, and like in the last game, they walk into space on the Milky Way. Yeah, okay, you know what, I'm not even going to like ponder how the hell this is possible. Yeah, never mind. 
Space Channel 5 Part 2 has more going for it in the story department, yet the characters are still largely the same. Well, okay, you know what? Maybe besides Ulala, I guess. Ulala gets a little bit more development towards the end, dealing with the initial death of her boss, Fuse, but then again, not by a must. And you know, hell, Space Monk can also be considered, as he has a lot more agency, acting as the chief of Space Channel 5, and fully helping Ulala towards the end. But I can't say that about Jaguar, Pudding, and Pine, who's just kind of there. And just like in the last game, there really isn't much left to talk about with the story, but I do want to use this time to talk about just some of my experience and the music real quick. Why? Because this soundtrack is so damn good. I know I didn't mention it before, but Space Channel 5's music is infectious. Between each level, there's always something interesting with how the music sounds, and it changes up a lot. One moment you'll be grooving to some big band jazz, and the next moment we out here listening to some Elvis inspired tunes. But with this game specifically, it goes further and adds more genres to the mix. There's of course the big band jazz, but there's also waltz and a little bit of pop sprinkled here and there. The third and fourth levels especially add some great tunes, and when Space Michael joins the fray, it damn near turns into one of his own songs, with some beatboxing to boot. And while researching who was on the soundtrack for this game, I saw a little familiar name on the credits. Come to find out one of the people involved with the soundtrack is Tomoyo Otani. You know, the man behind the music for most of the modern Sonic titles, including Sonic Frontiers, which... <laughs> you know what? Honestly, I honestly might review this sooner than later. Yeah, uh, just let me know if you guys want this after Guitar Hero Man or just save it for the Sonic retrospect. But I'm gonna be honest and also sorry in advance for what I'm about to say soon, but Purge's dancing animations are fucking wild. His animation ranges from him just vibing like he's in the 80s to him just busting it down like he's trying to steal your girl. Also, he looks like Justin Timberlake. I'm sorry to have put that image in your head. As far as everything else, there isn't really much left to talk about with the sequel. It's similar in length to the first game and a lot easier. But this would be the last mainline title for the series despite it reportedly selling well. This also would be the last game created by the UGA, as they would later be merged into Sonic Team. As with Mizuguchi, he ended up leaving Sega and in the same year, he made his own company Q Entertainment. Unfortunately, the company ended up going out of business 10 years later and Mizuguchi would create the new company, Enhanced Games. The franchise itself would remain dormant until the release of the VR title in 2019, and according to the game's story and game design director Takumi Yoshinaga, they had pitched a new title for the Wii and Kinect. Unfortunately, it didn't get the green light due to the worry that the series didn't have enough staying power. Though he did tease in the Kotaku interview that it would be a good time to bring Space Channel 5 back, which you know what, I'm fucking with. If I wanted to, I could just be annoying as shit and just spam Sega on Twitter for a new Space Channel 5 game. But I want to eventually work at Sega. So I'm not going to do that, tempted as I may. Despite not having a new game in a while, Ulula didn't really go anywhere. She still appeared in other Sega related games like Sonic Riders where she was a guest character, Sega Superstar Tennis, Sonic and Sega All-Star Racing, and... She's been referenced in TV shows, movies, and even League of Legends of all games. Like, her design and looks are just that iconic. Plus, last year it was revealed that Sega was going to produce a Space Channel 5 movie. Thank God that Sonic did well in the box office. Thank God. Oh, and I didn't know where to put this exactly, but I think right now might be as good as time as ever to mention this. But Sega got caught up in a lawsuit by none other than Lady Miss Keir, the singer of D-Light. If you don't know who D-Light are, they made the song... Oh god damn it! Back in 2003, Keir sued Sega for using her likeness in music despite declining the offer. However, she ended up losing that case in 2006 and had to pay Sega over $608,000 in legal fees. Damn! Regardless, it's nice to see that Sega hasn't forgotten Ulala, and I really hope that they go on to either make another title for her or even a remake in the future. So if y'all trying to get into this series, well, you know, which one should you start with? Personally, I recommend playing Space Channel 5 Part 2 first. Beyond its accessibility, the game strikes the perfect balance between forgiving and being difficult. Plus, the music is so damn good, and if you wanted to use the CPU mode, you couldn't use it and even deactivate it. Perfect for when you're just trying to bust a move. Mm. But don't leave out Space Channel 5 as that too is a good option. Oh, and guess what? Y'all don't have to pay a fucking premium for this game. Yes, for the first time in what feels like in a while, 
you can own these games on either the Dreamcast or PS2 for an affordable price. Thank God. The only one that will be expensive is the Dreamcast version of the second game. But then again, it's one of those games that has always been sort of pricey. Though I can't say that for the GBA port, Jesus Christ. Now, if y'all really want to own the second game on Dreamcast, then uh, prepare to pay the same price as you would for a AAA game, just without the microtransaction and bullshit. But with that, thank you guys so much for watching until the end of the video. So yeah, this video was actually pretty fun to you know do some research for and do some other stuff, though it was a pain in the ass to write it because of how short everything is. So yeah, I just hope that the next game that we do isn't gonna be as short, if that makes sense. Not only as short, but also as weird for some parts. The game is already weird itself, but yeah. Next time I see you guys, we'll be ending this mini retrospect with Guitaro Man, a game that I've been seeing all across my TikTok for you page for a while now. And honestly, I hope you guys are as hype as I am because I'm really looking forward to checking this game out. Like always, make sure to like, comment, subscribe if you guys enjoyed the video. Hit the little bell notification so you guys know when the next video is going to be coming out. And make sure to stay safe, wear a mask because it's getting crazy out there. Stay hydrated because it's hot as hell. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace!